So yeah, I'm here today to talk a bit about money laundering, and I guess there's probably some people in the audience that are quite interested in getting away with money laundering. Maybe, maybe you like to make an income through exploiting other people, through trafficking people, through trading arms, or corruption, or bribery. Um, and if you're here, then fantastic, we'll get through that bit in the first five minutes. I understand you're busy people, and you've got crimes to commit, money to launder, and you need to get back out there and, uh, and exploit more people. But after the first five minutes, what I want to do is get into talking a bit more about technology, because I assume that there's a lot of people here today that are more interested in the technical focus of how we look at financial crime and particularly money laundering. I'm going to be talking about topics such as uh, semantic triples and machine learning and some of the analytics that big data enables us to do and, and how it empowers a business and how it helps us solve problems. Okay, so money laundering 101. What is money laundering and how does it work? So the purpose of money laundering is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It is designed to turn dirty money into clean money. So if you've made money out of the proceeds of crime, for you to use that money, you want it to be able to disconnect the, the proceeds, what, what you do with that money, from the original crime, okay? So if you receive a bribe, for example, and then you use that money to straight away go out and buy a car or something, it'll be very, very easy for a regulator or, fi or a financial institution to track, you know what, this money's come from a government account into your account and gone straight to the car dealership. You know what, that car is the proceed of crime. I'm gonna go come and take it away. That's not what we want to happen. So what we do is, or, or what a money launderer would do, shall I say, um, <laughs> is, is engage in, in laundering the money. And there's three stages, typically, to money laundering. There's placement, layering, and integration. So placement is the first stage. It's where we introduce our dirty money into the financial system. It's perhaps depositing cash if you've been, if you've received a payment in cash, or it, it could be the introduction of dirty funds into your account. It's a pretty risky stage for a money launderer because this is where you've got very strong attachment to the, to the proceed of crime. Um, and so it's very, very traceable. And so we want to get it out of there pretty quickly. And so that's where we get into the next stage of layering. So layering is the stage where we look to obfuscate the, the funds. We, we look to disconnect the money from where it originally came from. And one of the most common ways to do this is to move it around the globe, okay? So if you set up shell companies in a bunch of different jurisdictions, if you have um, a lot of different accounts with all of these shell companies, and then you can move money from one account to the next, to the next, to the next. You can break your money up and put it in small parcels and move it all around. If you move across a lot of different jurisdictions, it makes it very, very difficult for any single regulator to follow all those funds and to trace it all back to its origin. The other thing that you want to do as you do this is to work through jurisdictions that have very low protections against money laundering, okay? So we've gone through this, we've, we've, we've layered our money and so it's now very, very difficult to come back to the source. There's one final stage of of the process, which is integration. And so integration is the fun bit, essentially. It's where, it's where we get to use our funds. So we've finally disconnected it, we've made it untraceable from the original source, and now we want to, we want to enjoy our wealth, our value. And so we might purchase um, luxury goods, we could purchase pieces of art or jewellery, um, potentially you know, a nice Ferrari or, or property. Okay? <coughs> So as we go through this, as a money launderer goes through this, there's two things that they're really trying to optimise for. Okay? One of them is efficiency, and the other thing is essentially minimising risk. And so in terms of efficiency, as we move money from one account to the next to the next, we know that this costs a bit of money. Every time you, you change currency or you move money, there's a small percentage that we lose. And we want to minimise that. We want you know, we want to keep down the actual cost of laundering our money. The other part of it is that we want, to, we, we want it to be efficient. If it takes six months to, to launder your funds, that's, that's pretty inefficient. I want my money to move through, to be quick, to come out the other end, and, and for me to be able to enjoy the proceeds. You know, it's essentially putting it on rapid wash. So then the other part is risk. So there's risk of detection, and there's a couple of ways we can think about this. One, one is with an individual payment or an individual sum of money that we're laundering. 
And we would like not to lose it, we'd like it not to be detected. But if it is detected and we do lose it, then you know what? That's just the nature of the business, it's part of the cost of doing business in this way. And we'll probably take that hit. What's far, far worse for someone engaged in financial crime is to be identified as a financial criminal, either by law enforcement or by the media. Because at the time that you're, you know, well, if law enforcement get you, then you're going to end up potentially in jail. Um, and, and I think it's fair to assume that, you know, financial criminals wouldn't like that. That's not an acceptable cost of doing business. But also if you're identified in the public as being a financial criminal or potentially picked up by a government and listed as a financial criminal, then it's going to be, become very, very difficult for you to continue to run a money laundering scheme, okay? Because your bank, your financial institution, any time you go to do business with someone, if your name has been pre previously associated with financial crime, they're going to be wary about doing business with you and that's going to, become, that's going to make it pretty hard for you to do what you're trying to do. Okay? So this is where we're at. The impact of money laundering is, is estimated to be in excess of $2 trillion every year. To put that into context, that, that's probably, sorry, that, that's more than 2% of the global economy. Okay? So it's a really significant issue. And the thing is that there are tools out there that are designed to detect and potentially prevent money laundering. But they have, but essentially we stop one to three percent of, of laundered funds in any given year. Now I know no other problem of this sort of scale, magnitude of two trillion dollars, where there are mature tools that have a one to three percent success rate, and this is considered fit for purpose. I think it's, it's absolutely obvious the system is broken and we need to have new approaches and new ideas and new methods to address this sort of problem. Okay, so what sort of solutions can we apply in practice? There's essentially three ways that we can look at detecting money laundering. It's through behaviour profiles and connections. I'm going to focus on the, on the second two for today. So when we're talking about profiles and connections, well, particularly profiles, what we're looking at is who are we doing business with or who are we enabling to do business? And what is, what is their political exposure? We know that politicians, due to the, the nature of their role in society, are at a heightened risk of bribery and corruption, okay? They have access to public funds and can control public funds. They have access to quite a lot of power. Um, and it's not to say that every politician is corrupt. Absolutely not. There's a lot of politicians around the world trying to do a huge number of fantastic things. But certainly they are at a heightened risk of this. Is there any information in the public domain, is there any adverse information or media that would cause us concern about doing business with this person, that, that links them back to financial crime? And finally, have they been put on any official sanctions list? If we know this information about the people that we're doing business with or that we're enabling to do business, then, then it becomes a lot cleaner. But we don't just want to know information about the individuals that we're doing business with. We also want to know what their connections, what their network looks like. Okay? Who are their relatives? Who are their close associates? Perhaps business partners? Which companies are they associated with? And again, building up a profile of each of those connections and so that we can understand a much larger picture and a much larger network of what someone's financial crime risk really looks like. Okay, so when we're talking about financial crime, what, what makes up a profile? We divide it into two areas. One is about identity and the other is about the financial crime risk. The financial crime risk is exactly what I've just mentioned in terms of information about political exposure, sanctions and adverse information and media. Now we're going to get this information from a variety of different sources. It's not all going to be all in the one place served up neatly for us to ingest and, and, and analyse. Um, that would be far too easy. So if we're getting this from a variety of different sources, we have to be able to draw a line between two sources to understand if they're talking about the same person or about different people. And that's where identity becomes so critical. So the first piece of information that we obviously want to know to, to try and identify someone is their name. But as we all know, names are not unique identifiers. You know, the seven and a half billion people in the world, the chances are that you know, for most names, more than one person possesses that name. And so to truly understand someone's identity, we need to look at a bunch of other biographical data. So dates of birth, places of birth, residency, occupations, 
Also family connections, when we're starting to build out that network of what someone looks like, who are their brothers and sisters, their parents, their children, who, who are their business partners and such like. And if we know all of this information about a person, we're essentially developing a, a unique identifier for them in, in putting all of this data together. We're developing a fingerprint that we can use to identify them and we can use to identify which pieces of information are talking about the same person or different people. So that's great. I, as a person, we as people can un I understand that, that the profile of a person can look like this. But we need to implement this into code. We need a computer to be able to understand it. There's a lot of different ways of modeling a person and, and describing them within code. And I'm going to talk about semantic triples today. So a semantic triple is a really, it, it's actually an incredibly simple basic data structure. Um, it has a subject, a predicate, and an object. So the subject is the thing that you're talking about, the thing that you have a piece of information on. The object is the piece of information you have, and the predicate is essentially the type of information that you possess. So to give you an example, if, if I'm talking about myself, I would say me, subject, name, predicate, Luke, object. Me, occupation, engineer. Right, it's very, very simple. But the power of it is that, given how it's structured, it's very easy for us to start to link up all these different pieces of information. And so, in terms of that third column I showed you before about understanding someone's connections, it immediately helps us solve that problem. So let's look at a slightly bigger example. Um, this character. Some of you may be familiar with him. This is a person. Their name is Liviu Drumia. Their date of birth is around about 1962. Country of birth, Romania, politician, etc. We have some information about him. We can also add in some family connections. We know he's got two kids, Valentin and uh, Alexandra. Okay? And we can start to build up more and more information both about Liviu himself as well as his kids and we can start to build up a network. Okay? Now this is pretty important and, and I guess as, as we build this out, one of the things that I would be concerned about is firstly, um, depending on the nature of business, I probably would be concerned about doing business with Liviu Dragonia to start off with. That could could adversely um, impact my reputation. But also, depending on the nature of business, I may be concerned about doing business with one of his children. At, at the very least, I'm going to want to know about this risk. So, let's, let's work through an example of trying to identify whether two people are the same or not. And as I said before, this is incredibly important because if we bring information from different sources, we need to be able to do this. So, using semantic triples, this is how we can start to map out the son of Liviu Drognia. Okay? His name's Valentin Drognia, he's male, he's Romanian. I believe his residence is in Romania. I'm not 100% sure what his occupation is. Now, it turns out that there's a company in the UK, and it has a, there's a company in the UK with a director called Valentin Drognia. And the same way that I'd be concerned about doing business with the son of Liviu Drognia, if this person is the same, then I'm going to be concerned about doing business with that company, all right? So I need to understand whether these two are the same or whether they're different. So we go to UK company's house and we pull out the information that we can find out about them. Same name, same nationality, same gender. We've also got occupation listed as a builder and we've got residence listed as the UK. So we've got, we've got two profiles here. Are they the same or are they different? And if I'm looking at these two profiles, knowing nothing else, I'm thinking they're probably not the same. But I'm, I'm really not 100% sure. Like, there's just not enough information. Maybe the occupation is misrepresented, maybe the residency is, has a data input error, I don't know. So I'm going to add one more piece of information to these two profiles, which is each one's date of birth. And if the dates of birth are quite similar, then I'm going to be confident that they're actually the same person. It's unlikely to have two people called Valentin Dragnia who, who are born in a very small space of time. On the other hand, if the dates of birth are quite divergent, then we'd be quite comfortable in saying these are different people and I'm very comfortable in doing business with this company in the UK. And so we find out dates of birth are more than 10 years apart. Okay, fantastic, these are not the same people. So subjectively, as a human, I can identify these are not the same people. 
What we need to do is teach the computer how to do this, to, to implement this into code. And so how we're going to do that is using multivariate Bayesian inference. Okay. So what we do is we start off with naive Bayes classifiers. And this approach assumes that each one of these variables, each one of these characteristics about a person is, is independent from one another. Now that's not 100% true, okay? So you know, given someone's name, you can start to infer their nationality, for example. But as an assumption, it actually works pretty well and we, we get a reasonable output. But it's important to, for us to understand the, our assumptions and the strengths or weaknesses of those. Okay, so we go through and we try and calculate the probability based on nothing else but having the same name, for example. Are these two people the same? Is the person on the right the, the Valentin Dragnia from the left? Okay, no, nothing else but occupation, same probability, etc. The probability that two people are the same if they share the same date of birth or they have different dates of birth. And we can calculate all these as independent variables or independent probabilities. And then what we want to do is put them all together. So basically we take the log of each probability, we weight them, and we add them up. The biggest issue is calculating the weights of these probabilities, and obviously we want a greater weight attached to something like name or date of birth than we do occupation or nationality. And so how we calculate these weights is we, we get a, a set of data where we know the output, we know whether two people are the same or different, and, and we feed all this in and we use linear regression to calculate those weights. We've got, a, we've got a function, we can implement this in code, great, we now have a way of automatically identifying whether two people are the same or different. And what I've just walked through with multivariate Bayesian inference is one of the fundamental building blocks of data science or machine learning. Okay? So this is where we start, and it, and it kind of shows the power that we have today to be able to do all this analysis, to generate these weights, and to put that into production. So I've talked about how we identify whether two profiles are the same or different, but one of the things that is key is generating these triples, and we kind of skipped over that. Where do we get all this information from? Now, a large amount of information in the public domain is available in textual format. And there's a lot of information to extract there. So I've got this press release that came out of the US. And I don't expect you to read it all. Don't, don't get concerned about that. Um, but it's basically talking about how Livio Dragnia is banned from entering the US, and uh, so are his children. But there's a lot of information that we can pull out there. And using machine learning techniques of name identity recognition and relationship extraction, we can process this article, and we can understand the different parts of text, the different parts of of the language, and we can and we can start to to extract that information or that data. So here we've gone through and we've tagged all the people, all the entities in yellow. We've got occupations or positions in aqua. We've got locations in, in pink, and finally we've got one relationship that I've highlighted in red. So drug near two children. Okay. So I'm not going to dive down deep into how we do this. So, uh, uh, at how name identity recognition or relationship extraction works. One of the beautiful things today is that these sorts of machine learning techniques are available as a package. You can go into AWS Comprehend, for example. You can use its API, you can pass it an article or pass it a piece of text, and it will tell you which, it, it can extract entities for you, it can tell you about relationships, it can give you a huge amount of data, of structured data, out of a piece of text. So, why are we so bad at detecting and preventing money laundering? Part of the reason is the way that this problem has been approached in the past. It's been approached through manual analysts. And if you think analysing an article like this, someone could do it as part of their job. If someone's going to read an article, it probably takes them about four minutes to do that, and, and then they can go and update a profile. They can potentially get through 120 articles in an eight-hour shift. So let's say we get a team of 200 analysts, great, we can get 24,000 articles done every working day. Doesn't sound too bad, until you look at the, the column on the right. Using the techniques that I've talked about today, um, we've been able to build a system that is able to process five million news articles every single day, okay? And, and when you consider the amount of information in the public domain and the amount that's being published on a daily basis is only increasing. If we continue to try and solve this problem with manual analysts, 
it's simply never going to work. We, we're never going to be able to take the fight to financial criminals. Looking at this five million a day figure, another way to look at it is how many analysts would you need to solve that problem? And the answer to that is you'd need 35,000 analysts working full time to do that. That is the entire workforce of Goldman Sachs. If all Goldman Sachs did was get every man and woman to sit in front of their computers, read articles, update profiles, and that's 100% the of what they did, they would be able to do the same as what we do in production at, at a fraction of the cost of, of, of hiring that many people. Trying to detect and prevent money laundering is actually an incredibly difficult problem, as you may imagine, and it's, it's part of the reason why we have such a low success rate today. I think, you know, there's seven and a half billion people in the world, and the vast majority of us are trying to do the right thing. You're looking for a fraction of 1%, and the problem is that that fraction of 1% is, looks very, very similar to the rest of us. And so, it, it, some people talk about this problem as looking for a needle in a haystack, and I, I would contend it's not a needle in a haystack, because when you find the needle, you're 100% sure you've got the needle. Looking for, for money laundering in a massive set of transactions or a money launderer out of a, a huge set of clients is like looking for a piece of straw in a haystack. You might find it, but you're still not going to be 100% sure that you've got it. So it's an incredibly difficult problem. It's an incredibly important problem. And so this is where we stand. We, we need the smartest minds working on this. We need outstanding systems, and we need absolutely the best data if we're going to have any chance of addressing one of the world's biggest problems today. All right, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for listening to me and your attention. If anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Luke. Very, very interesting. Please. Um, hi, so uh, your, um, your presentation is about identifying a potential uh, people that might uh, be subjected to bribery or have been accused of financial, okay, but are you connecting them to actual uh, shell companies or accounts or to actually identify, okay, if some money went through that account, that account might be linked to the person? Yeah, yeah so it's a good question. It's, it's a really challenging problem. Um, so one of the, the first thing is that with shell companies, they're often registered in jurisdictions that have very tight privacy laws, so it's often incredibly difficult to find out um, who owns that company or who's the director of that company. So associating people with shell companies, if they've been set up, is, is incredibly challenging. And so that's where we focus on the first and the last stage a bit more about placement and integration. If we can stop those parts happening, then you know, the, the bit in the middle can spin around all it likes and, and do nothing. Um, Following transactions is incredibly important, and I've intentionally skipped over that today because there's just not enough time to get into it all. I think it's, it's definitely about understanding the risk that someone poses from a financial crime point of view. Are they someone who's been accused, convicted, exonerated of any sort of financial crime? And you mentioned things like bribery and corruption. I mean, for corruption to be effective, you need money laundering. Um, otherwise, you end up like Livio drugging you in jail. If, if it's easy to trace the proceeds of your crime back to the source of funds, then, then you're going to be in trouble. Thank you. <coughs> I have a question here. You mentioned you process about 5 million articles per day. Yep. How do you handle fake news? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've talked a lot about automation. Um, the thing is that you can bring people in at various stages. So. The first thing is that there's definitely some publications that we can identify that we would trust and we would assume don't have any fake news. And so, as a UK resident, if I'm focused on UK publications, I'm thinking about things like the BBC, The Guardian, The Times. You know, these are strongly reputable um, publications. It's when, you, it's when you start getting down into uh, less well-known publications and perhaps <coughs> in developing countries where, where there's perhaps less editorial oversight that it starts to become a bit challenging. One of the ways we do it is through having analysts curate the set of publications that we look at and that we trust. Um, it works very well. It's not a perfect system, um, but, but it's been quite successful to date. It's not quite the same sort of challenge that Facebook or, 
or other social media organisations have where just anything from any organisation can get published. We, we can control what articles or what sources we go after. Yeah, um, I have a, two small questions. Uh, first of all, first question is related to the fact that if you're in this market, I suppose you know about the Palantir software. If you do, what is the difference between what you're doing and Palantir? And the second is, is there anything else except the Bayesian theories which can be applied in this domain? Because in machine learning, evolutionary algorithms, everything basically is based on Bayesian. Is there anything else or not? Okay, I think I don't think you're going to be satisfied with either of my answers, unfortunately. Um, yeah, Palantir do have software that does do deep investigation. Um, I'm not an expert on their software. I I can't give you a strong indication of what where they um, of what their systems do that we don't, or vice versa. Um, I guess. My understanding is that it's that you come in and you apply it to a certain situation, and it does a deep investigation. Whereas this, you know, when, when you're operating a financial institution, you have a huge number of customers, and you need to screen all of them, and you need the best data and information on each and every one of them. Because again, in terms of the needle and the haystack problem, you, you know, if you've got a thousand customers, how many of them are money launderers? You don't know. So you need you need to be able to apply this on a mass scale. Um, are there other machine learning techniques that we can use, yes, absolutely. Um, I've, I've presented one today in terms of something that's, that I can get in a short presentation and present a way that we can understand this. Um, the, the problem of identifying whether or not two people are the same or different is incredibly complex and a lot of different companies struggle with it in a number of different domains. I don't know how many of you um, have dealt with a large database of clients. Or, or accounts or anything like that, and you've looked, if you've ever looked over the data, chances are that you've got some duplicates in there. And it's just so frustrating when, when, you can't, when you've got no simple way of merging duplicates within a database. And that's a very straightforward problem insofar as you've got your own database, you control your own data. When, when you're looking at sources from, you know, well, from literally tens of thousands of different um, information sources, it, it becomes incredibly challenging. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question about how uh, was your initially training data set? How have you initially labeled uh, an entity as a financial criminal? So, in the example I've used, I'm not labelling people as financial criminals or not. What I'm using is whether or not two profiles represent the same person. Okay? So, you know, first off, let's be clear on that. But if we go back to, um, let's see. Yeah, if we go back to this article. So, I demonstrated that you can extract entities and you can extract relations from it. And, and this is Im important to build up the identity of a person. But, the other part of the profile that we're trying to build up is a financial crime risk. So one of the other pieces of information here is that Livio Drugnia and both of his children are banned from entering the United States. Okay? So here we're starting to get um, starting to get a mention of, of I guess a financial crime risk. It's not an explicit statement. I, well, I, actually I guess you know the US government is is basically saying that they believe that Livio Drugnia is associated with corruption. Okay? So what we can do is take a piece of text like this, we can label it and we can say, well, this text <coughs> implies that Livio Drugnia is associated with corruption and we can use that for training when we're looking for association with financial crime. All right? It, but yeah, generating training data is an incredibly manual process and it takes a long time. Fortunately, you do it once and then you can use your system over and over again, rather than having the entire population of Goldman Sachs working every day to do it. Do you have other questions? It seems not. Thank you, Luke. All right, thank you very much.